Lesson 3 for January 9 to 15, ready for teaching on January 16, When Your World is Falling Apart, and read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, January 9. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're studying the book of Isaiah, and out of it comes your love, your grace, and your foresight. And right now, in this lesson, we're going to be studying about when difficulties arise. And we pray that as we do so, that there may be lessons for us there that show us how to react, how to put our reliance on you. We thank you that because Jesus came and lived and died, that each of us can have salvation and we can plant our faith on that at any time. Bless us now as we open your word. May your Holy Spirit guide us in our individual lives and in our study of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 9. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Let's read that again. Isaiah 7 verse 9. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. One Sabbath, Connie and Roy drove into their driveway after church. A bantam hen flew frantically across the yard in front of them. Something was wrong. The pet birds were supposed to be safely in their pen, but had gotten out. Quick investigation showed a tragedy in process. Beethoven, the neighbour's small dog, also had escaped her yard and was down by the pond with Daisy in her mouth. Daisy was a beautiful laying hen with fluffy white tail feathers. Connie rescued Daisy, but it was too late. Her precious pet, now with a mangled neck, soon died in Connie's arms. She sat down in the yard, holding the bird, the dead bird, and wailed. Another pet was deeply disturbed. A tall white duck by the name of Waddlesworth saw Connie holding Daisy and seemed to have assumed she had killed her. So, for the next few weeks, whenever Waddlesworth saw Connie, he would viciously attack her, pinching her painfully with his strong bill. Sometimes it is hard to sort out who your friends and enemies are. This week, we'll look at a king of Judah who also had this problem, and will seek to understand why he made the wrong choices he did. Sunday, January 10. Danger from the North. Our text for today, uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verses 1 to 9. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Isaiah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim, so his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear to be faint-hearted, for these two stubs of smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Ramaliah. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramaliah have plotted evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves, and set a king over them, the son of Tabal. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within sixty-five years Ephraim will be broken, so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established." 
question, what terrifying crisis did King Ahaz face early in his reign? First of all, we read Second Kings 15, verses 37 and 38. In those days, the Lord began to send Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, against Judah. So Jotham rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David his father. Then Ahaz his son reigned in his place. And Second Kings 16 verses 5 and 6. Then Rezin king of Syria and Pekah the son of Remaliah king of Israel came up to Jerusalem to make war. And they besieged Ahaz but could not overcome him. At that time, Rezin, king of Syria, captured Elath for Syria and drove the men of Judah from Elath. Then the Edomites went to Elath and dwell there to this day. And Isaiah 7, 1 and 2 again. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Isaiah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it but could not prevail against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. The kingdoms of northern Israel, Ephraim, and Syria, Aram, ganged up on the smaller country of Judah to the south. This happened when Judah was weakened by attacks from the Edomites and Philistines. In the past, Judah had fought against Israel, but an alliance between Israel and Syria presented an overwhelming peril. It appears Israel and Syria wanted to force Judah to participate with them in a coalition against the mighty power of tiglath pileser III of Assyria, called Pul in Second Kings 15.19, who continued to threaten them with his expanding empire. Let's read that. Pul, king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menahem gave Pul a thousand talents of silver, that his hand might be with him to strengthen the kingdom under his control. Israel and Syria had put aside their long-standing struggle against each other in view of a greater danger. If they could conquer Judah and install a puppet ruler there, as we read in Isaiah 7, 5 and 6 before, they could use its resources and manpower. Those verses. Verse 5. Because Syria, Ephraim and the son of Remaliah have plotted evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves, and set a king over them the son of Tabal. Question, what was Ahaz's solution when his world was falling apart? Second Kings 16, 7-9 So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and save me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel, who rise up against me. And Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house and set it as a present to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria heeded him. For the king of Assyria went up against Damascus and took it, carried his people captive to Kerr and killed Rezin. And Second Chronicles chapter 28, 16. At the same time, King Ahaz sent to the kings of Assyria to help him. Rather than recognising that God was the only friend who could rescue him and his country, Ahaz tried to make a friend out of tiglath Pelisa III, the enemy of his enemies. The Assyrian king happily complied with his request for aid against Syria and Israel. Not only did tiglath Pelisa receive a rich bribe from Ahaz, but he also gained a good excuse to take Syria which he promptly did, as we have already read in Second Kings 16.9. The power of the Syrian-Israelite alliance was broken. In the short run, it appeared that Ahaz had saved Judah. This action on Ahaz's part, however, should not come as a surprise. He had been one of the worst kings ever to rule Judah up to this point, as we read in Second Kings 16, 
3 and 4. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Indeed, he made his son pass through the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. And in Second Chronicles 28, verses 2 to 4, For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made moulded images for the Baals. He burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burned his children in the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. So to finish today, when we read about what Ahaz was like, it is understandable why he reacted to danger as he did. What lesson is here for us on a personal level? If we're not obeying the Lord now, what makes us think we'll have the faith to trust him when real trials come? Well, James 2.22 reads, Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And Jeremiah 12, verse 5, If you have run with the footmen, and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? And if the land of peace, in which you trusted, they wearied you, then how will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? Monday, January 11. Attempted Interception While Ahaz was weighing his political options to meet the threat from Israel and Syria, God knew some things he did not. For one thing, it was God who had allowed trouble to come upon him in order to discipline him and bring him to his senses, as we read in Second Chronicles 28. Verse 5, Therefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria. They defeated him and carried away a great multitude of them as captives and brought them to Damascus. Then he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who defeated him with a great slaughter. And verse 19, For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz king of Israel, for he had encouraged moral decline in Judah, and had been continually unfaithful to the Lord. Moreover, although appealing to Tiglath-Pileser for help seemed logical and attractive from a human standpoint, God knew it would bring the Davidic kingdom of Judah under foreign control, from which she could never recover. The stakes were staggeringly high, so the Lord sent Isaiah to intercept the king, apparently as he was inspecting Jerusalem's water supply in preparation for a siege, in order to persuade him not to contact the Assyrian leader. Question. Why did the Lord tell Isaiah to take his son, Shea Jashub, with him? Isaiah 7, verse 3, Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Shea Jashub, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. Ahaz would be startled when Isaiah greeted him and introduced his son, named A Remnant Shall Return. Remnant of whom? Shall return from what? Because the boy's father was a prophet, the name sounded like an ominous message from God among people going into captivity. Or was it about returning to God in the sense of repenting? The verb return also carries the meaning of repentance. The message from God to Ahaz was, It means what you make it mean. Turn from your sins or go into captivity, and from captivity a remnant will return. The decision is yours. Question, how did God's message address the king's situation? In Isaiah 7, verses 4 to 9, And said to him, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted, for these two stubs of smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Ramaliah. 
Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramaliah have plotted evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves, and set a king over them, the son of Tabor. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Resin. Within sixty-five years Ephraim will be broken, so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. The threat from Syria and Israel would pass, and Judah would be spared. Powers that looked to Ahaz like huge, fiery volcanoes were in God's sight only two smouldering stumps of firebrands, as we read in verse 4. There was no need for Ahaz to appeal to Assyria for help. But, in order to make the right decision, Ahaz needed to trust the Lord and his promises. He needed to believe in order to be established, as it said in verse 9. The words for believe and be established are from the same Hebrew word, from which come also the word for truth that which is reliable, and the word Amen, affirming which is true or reliable. Ahaz needed to be sure in order to be made sure. He needed to rely in order to be reliable. So to finish today, look at that last section of Isaiah 7, 9. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Why are faith and belief so important in order to be established? Established in what? How does this principle apply in the life of the Christian? Tuesday, January 12, Another Chance. Our text today is Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 to 13. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, it is a small thing for you to weary men. But will you weary my God also? Ahaz did not respond to Isaiah's call for faith. So, God mercifully gave the king another chance, telling him to ask for a sign that was deep as Sheol or high as heaven in verse 11. Here is one of the greatest invitations to faith ever given to human being. Unlike lottery or sweepstakes, God placed no restrictions in fine print. God did not even limit his offer to the half of his kingdom, as human rulers did when they reached the upper limit of their generosity. As we read in Esther chapter 5 and verse 6, at the banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, What is your petition? It shall be granted you. What is your request? Up to half the kingdom? It shall be done. And Esther 7 and verse 2, And on the second day at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you, and what is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done. And Mark chapter 6 and verse 23, he also swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half the kingdom. He was ready and willing to empty all of heaven and earth for a wicked king if he would only believe. As a sign, Ahaz could have asked for a mountain of gold or soldiers as numerous as grains of sand by the Mediterranean. Question, why did Ahaz respond in the way he did? Verse 12, But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. At first glance, Ahaz's answer seems pious and respectful. He would not put God to the test, as the Israelites had centuries before, during their wilderness wanderings, as we read in Exodus chapter 17 and verse 2, 
Therefore the people contended with Moses, and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And Deuteronomy 6.16 You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. But the difference was that God invited the king to put him to the test. Compare that with Malachi 3.10 Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. To take him up on his overwhelmingly generous gift would please him, not test his patience. But Ahaz was not even willing to allow God to help him to believe. He barred and bolted the door of his heart to shut out faith. Question, read Isaiah 7, verse 13. What is Isaiah saying here? Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Isaiah pointed out that by refusing to put God to the test, outwardly to avoid wearying God, Ahaz in fact wearied God. But the most troubling aspect of this verse is the fact that here Isaiah refers to my God by clear contrast in Isaiah 7.11, where the prophet asked the king to ask a sign of the Lord your God. When Ahaz refused the divine offer, he rejected the Lord from being his God. The Lord was the God of Isaiah, but not of Ahaz. And so to finish the day. What does this day study teach us about God's forbearance and willingness to bring all of us to salvation? What also does it tell us about the blindness and hardness of the human heart when not surrendered completely to the Lord? In the end, even if God had given Ahaz any sign that he had wanted, do you think Ahaz would then have believed? Explain your answer. Wednesday, January 13, Sign of a Son Our text for today is Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. An offer of a sign, as deep as Sheol, or high as heaven, as in Isaiah 7.11, did not move Ahaz. So, when God says he himself will come up with a sign, in Isaiah 7.14, we expect it to have breathtaking dimensions that only the divine imagination could devise. And we're going to compare a couple of texts here, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts, and 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. But, as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Surprise! The sign is a son. But how could a young woman bearing a child and calling him Emmanuel be a sign of biblical proportions? Who is the woman, and who is her child? Nowhere does the Old Testament point out a fulfilment of this important sign, as it had done for the signs given to other people, such as Gideon, as in Judges chapter 6, verses 36 to 40. So Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, 
Do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. So, here are some of the possible fulfilments based on the Old Testament alone. 1. Because the word for young woman refers to a young woman of marriageable age, many assume that she is a married woman living in Jerusalem, perhaps the wife of Isaiah. Isaiah 8.3 does record the birth of a son to Isaiah by the prophetess, referring to his wife whose prophetic messages consisted at least of her two children. So, let's read Isaiah chapter 7, verse 3. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And Isaiah eight eighteen, Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are the signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, who dwells in Mount Zion. However, this son was named Mahir Shalal Hash Baz, as we read in Isaiah 8, 1-4, not Emmanuel. Let's read Isaiah 8, 1-4. Moreover, the Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with a man's pen concerning Maher Shalal Hashbaz, and I will take for myself faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jubarachiah. Then I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, Call his name Maher Shalal Hash Baz, for before the child shall have knowledge to cry, My father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before the king of Assyria. Nevertheless, the signs of the two boys are similar in that before they reach the stage at which they can choose good or evil, Syria and northern Israel would be devastated as we've just read in Isaiah 8 verse 4, but also in Isaiah 7:16, For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. 2. Some suggest that Emmanuel is Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, who became the next king, but nowhere is the name Emmanuel applied to him. 3. Because Emmanuel is somewhat mysterious and his name, commonly translated God with us, refers to God's presence, he could be the same as the special son prophesied in Isaiah 9 and 11. If so, his exalted description as divine in Isaiah 9, 6 and the root of Jesse 11 verse 10 surpasses anything that could be ascribed to good King Hezekiah. So let's read Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then Isaiah 11 verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. 4. A natural birth to an unmarried woman of marriageable age would result in an illegitimate child through illegal promiscuity, as we read in Deuteronomy 22, verses 20 and 21. But if the thing is true, and evidences of virginity are not found for the young woman, then they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her to death with stones, because she has done a disgraceful thing in Israel, to play the harlot in her father's house, so you shall put away the evil from among you. Why would God refer to such a child as a sign to inspire faith? 
In contrast, the New Testament identifies Jesus as Emmanuel in Matthew 1, verses 21 to 23, born miraculously and with purity to an unmarried but betrothed virgin. Let's read that, Matthew 1, beginning at verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Jesus is the divine Son, as we read in Isaiah 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And in Matthew 3, verse 17, And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the shoot and root of Jesse, as in Isaiah 11, verse 1, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. And verse 10 of the same chapter, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. And Revelation 22 and verse 10, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Perhaps an earlier Emmanuel, whose development proved to Ahaz the timeliness of prophetic fulfilments, served as a forerunner of Christ. We do not know. But we know what we need to know. In Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, to give us the presence of God with us. And so to finish today. Dwell on the reality of Christ's coming into humanity. What kind of comfort can this reality give us amid what seems like a cold, fearsome and uncaring world? Thursday, January 14. God is with us. Our text for today is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Like the name of Isaiah's children, Shia Jazab, a remnant, shall return, and Mehez Shalel Hashbaz, which means swift is beauty, speedy is prey, the name of Emmanuel has a meaning. It is literally, with us, God. But the commonly accepted translation, God with us, misses something important. As with other Hebrew names of this kind that lack verbs, the verb to be must be supplied, because it is not expressed in Hebrew. So, Emmanuel must be translated, God is with us. Compare the same words in Isaiah 8 verse 10. Just as the name Jesus in the Greek and short for Hebrew, Yehoshua, or Joshua, means the Lord of Salvation, with the verb again being supplied, compare Isaiah, which means Salvation of the Lord. Isaiah 8 verse 10. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak the word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. But the name Emmanuel is not just an abstract description. It is an assertion of a promise that is fulfilled now. God is with us. Question, what is the significance of the promise that God is with us? There is no stronger assurance and comfort. God does not promise that his people will not endure hardship and pain, but he promises to be with them. 
The psalmist says in Psalm 23, 4, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. From the book God's Faulty Heroes, published in 1996 by the Review and Herald Publishing Association, page 66, and authored by the author of this quarter's lessons, Professor Roy Gain, we read, God says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Isaiah 43, 2. Where was the Lord when the Babylonians threw Daniel's three friends into the fire? With them, as we read in Daniel 3, 23-25. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counsellors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And where was the Lord during the time of Jacob's trouble, when he wrestled until daybreak, in Jacob's arms as close as he could get? Genesis 32, verses 24 to 30. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men, and have prevailed. Then Jacob said, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved." Even when the Lord does not appear in physical form on earth, he goes through the experiences of his people with them. Where was the Lord when the mob condemned Stephen? Standing at the right hand of God, we read in Acts 7.55. But when Jesus ascended to heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, Hebrews 1.3. Why did he stand when Stephen was in trouble, about to be stoned to death? As Morris Venden has said, Jesus wasn't going to take that sitting down. End of quote. So to finish today, even though we have the promise that God is with us, what difference does that make if we still face terrible trials and suffering? What good does the knowledge of his presence then do for us? Explain your answer. Friday, January 15. From the book Desire of Ages, page 19, we read, His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God, the image of his greatness and majesty, the outshining of his glory. It was to manifest this glory that he came to our world. To this sin-darkened earth he came to reveal the light of God's love, to be God with us. Therefore it was prophesied of him, his name shall be called Emmanuel. End of quote. And from Prophets and Kings, page 329. Well would it have been for the kingdom of Judah had Ahaz received this message as from heaven. But, choosing to lean on the arm of flesh, he sought help from the heathen. In desperation he sent word to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, 
I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Assyria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. Second Kings 16.7 The request was accompanied by a rich present from the king's treasure and from the temple storehouse. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. When you are in the process of making a decision, is it appropriate to ask God for a sign? What dangers are possibly inherent in doing something like that? 2. It is good to have human assistance, but how do you recognise its limits? 3. Russian author Leo Tolstoy wrote to a friend that once a man has realised that death is the end of everything, then there is nothing worse than life either. How does our knowledge that God is with us answer such a statement? And to summarise this week's lesson, God brought faithless King Ahaz to circumstances in which he had to make a difficult decision, to believe or not to believe. This is the question. Even though the Lord offered him any sign that his imagination could devise, he refused to allow God to demonstrate a reason why he should believe. Instead, he chose as his friend the king of Assyria. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Floating Red Book and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Taroni Kuma Tripura was thrilled to receive a Bible with a beautiful red cover in his remote village in southeast Bangladesh. The Bible arrived as a reward for completing a series of Bible lessons by mail. But Taroni had to be careful. His father served as a priest in the family's traditional religion, and he would not be pleased that his son had a Bible about the God of Heaven. Taroni, however, wasn't worried. He had studied the Bible lessons every night while his parents slept, and he also intended to read the Red Bible at night. The plan seemed to work. Taroni tended father's cows during the day, and after returning home at night, waited until his parents were asleep to eagerly switch on a tiny flashlight and read about God. One night, Father caught Taroni reading the Bible. He was furious. After his son left the house the next day, he seized the red Bible and threw it into the muddy waters of the Chengi River. Taroni was distraught when he realised that his red Bible was missing. He quickly understood what had happened. What could he do? He couldn't afford to buy another Bible. The correspondence school probably wouldn't send him a second Bible. But he longed to read more about God. Some time passed. One afternoon, Taroni was swimming in the Chengi River when he saw something floating on the water. He had seen plastic bottles and other garbage in the river, but this looked different. He swam closer. Reaching out, he grabbed the object with his hand and hastily swam to shore. Climbing onto the river bank, he raised his hand to see a dripping red Bible. He couldn't believe it. It was his missing Bible. Taroni placed the book on the grass in the hot sun to dry. It took 14 days to dry the Bible, and then he began to read it again. As he read, he fell in love with God. Even though he risked angering his father, he couldn't keep the newfound love to himself. He told other villagers about the God of the Red Bible that wouldn't sink in the river. The astounding villagers asked to know more. Today, most of the villagers, including many of Taroni's relatives, worship the God of the Red Bible. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.